Welcome to PRI's podcast. I'm your host, Romina Ichon. In this episode, we're in for a treat. Wonk and wine expert David White. Dave is an executive at a public affairs firm in Washington, D.C., but he's also an expert on wine. About a decade ago, he became interested in wine, and believe it or not, PRI actually had a hand in it. He tells a story on the podcast. Since then, he's written two books and founded the popular website, terroirist.com. Tim and I are PRI's Director of Communications, and I talk with Dave on everything wine. Should we still drink red with meat, or should we break all the rules? What about screw cap versus cork? What's a good wine to drink or give as a gift this holiday season? And since David is a like-minded colleague when it comes to free markets, we also talk about the issues facing the wine industry in California. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to PRI's podcast, Dave. Thank you. It's great to be with you guys. Dave, you're a VP in a public affairs firm in Washington by day, but you have an outside job that many of us envy running a daily wine blog. Tell us about your passion for wine and what led you to start a daily award-winning blog. You know, it actually all started with the Pacific Research Institute, and I'm not just saying that. It was on the. It was uh, back in 2010, no, not that, back in 2007, I was out in San Francisco for the PRI annual dinner. And after the annual dinner, I went on my first trip to Napa Valley and just absolutely fell in love with everything out there. So, you know, 10 years ago, I would have been, I guess, uh, 25, 26 years old. And, you know, it's, you know, for the first time in your life, you have a little bit of money to spend uh, beyond just rent and, you know, ramen noodle. So the, the first thing I was spending that money on was eating and drinking better. So there was no better vacation for me than spending a couple of days up in Napa with a couple of close friends. And I just fell in love with everything. So as soon as I got back home, I started reading as many books as I could, going to many tastings as I could, taking classes. And, you know, for a long time in D.C., I started my career in D.C. as a speechwriter. And our public affairs firm, while today we do, uh, you know, we're a full service firm, we started really as a writing company. So by 2010, I was uh, obsessed with wine and I hadn't written too much under my own name. And I thought to myself, you know, if there's an issue I'm passionate about enough, you know, passionate enough to write about under my own name, it's wine. So that's when I jumped in and I decided to sort of take it seriously from day one and just write a lot of content right away. David, for our listeners who may not have heard about your website, where can they go to find it and what will they find when they visit there? Sure. So the site is terroirist.com. And what makes it unique is it's a daily wine blog. If you're a wine geek like I am and you're looking for something to read every day that keeps you up to date on what wine enthusiasts and wine geeks across the world are reading and talking about, it's sort of a one-stop shop for that. Every single morning, uh, there's a daily news roundup. So it's a human news aggregator. We have a great contributor named Shelby. Every single day of the week, Monday through Friday, she is combing through uh, news articles from across the world, opinion columns from across the world, message boards, just to really curate a fantastic compendium of of what you should read if you really care about wine on any given day. Um, Most Fridays, we interview a winemaker from somewhere in the world, generally the United States because of the language barrier. About once every week or so, we review a book that's come out. So it's, you know, it's it's, it's got a lot of content, but, you know, at least every single day, you can go there and and get links to what you should read if you're a wine geek somewhere in the world. Dave, as you know, wine is a very important industry in California. So can you tell our listeners just how important and how big it is in the state? Yeah, it's absolutely huge. Uh, obviously, you know, especially if any of your listeners are, are anywhere near the Pacific Research Institute, they think about Napa Valley because it's so close to, uh, you know, to San Francisco. But that's really just a fraction, fraction, fraction of the California wine industry. The United States has about eight, eight to 9,000 wineries. About 5,000 of those are in California. Uh, so well over half of the wineries in the United States are actually in California. Obviously, California also produces the vast majority of the wine that Americans drink. That's at all levels. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the jug wine and boxed wine comes from the Central Valley, and a lot of the high-end wine comes from Northern California. It also has a huge economic impact uh, on the country. The California wine industry across the country employs nearly 800 
100,000 people, about 40% of whom are in California. Um, that's because wineries in California have staffers and distributors and representatives and marketing folks in New York and DC and Philadelphia and Chicago and all the and all the cities. Um, so all told, the industry actually generates about $114 billion in annual economic activity. So it's certainly one of California's uh, most, most critical industries. And the other thing that I think particularly cool about wine in California is the tourism industry it's resulted in. There's Napa Valley tourism, there's Sonoma tourism, there's the Santa Barbara County tourism. You know, so across uh, the state, uh, a lot of folks travel simply to visit wineries. Uh, There's a reason why a lot of folks do call Napa Disney World for adults. So... You know, that's a very interesting point that you make, David. Uh, Back in the day when I worked in Governor Schwarzenegger's administration, ag tourism was actually one of the big selling points when the governor would go on his various trade missions. The governor went on an Asian trade mission during the time that I worked there, and one of the messages that we pushed was, come to California and see where they grow things. And so it's certainly something that has uh, grown in importance to our economy over the years. You know, David, the growers in California have seen some very challenging years as of late. The long drought, the recent fires in Napa and Sonoma. And then, of course, there's the mishmash of regulations that's burdened not only grape growers, but the agricultural industry in general in the state. Share with us some of your thoughts on these issues that are affecting the wine industry in California. Sure. You know, I, I, folks who listen to the PRI podcast are probably policy geeks. And once you scratch below the surface of any issue, one is typically uh, surprised, no matter how much of a policy wonk they are, they're just surprised about how many policies impact virtually every single industry. So obviously the industries you care about a lot, that's when you end up learning about all the uh, issues that impact that industry. Some of the obvious ones, you know, NIMBYism, folks, for example, in Napa or Sonoma, they think there's been enough development, so they try and halt development. Obviously as a wine drinker, that has some uh, positive effects, but as as a free marketer, I see the downside of that. And also, you know, there's some downside that people don't necessarily see. For example, Willamette Valley in Oregon, they make some of the greatest Pinot Noir in the country. I would argue they make some of the greatest Pinot Noir in the world. One of the reasons Willamette really came to exist was because of zoning restrictions to prevent that part, because it's not too far from Portland, to really prevent the Willamette Valley from turning into this sort of overgrown, overdeveloped suburb of Portland full of high-rise buildings and and dense, dense populations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So fortunately, as a wine drinker, what does that result in? That results in the discovery of some of the greatest terroir in our country for Pinot Noir. But what else does that mean? That means that it's tremendously expensive to live there. So it has this really negative impact on folks who are struggling to find an affordable place to live. So, you know, those are sort of the, some of the policy issues that folks don't even think about. California obviously is struggling with water. Um, so that's all, that's a perpetual issue in wine country, especially over the last few years. You know, there's been a multi-year drought right now across the state of California. So new wineries especially do struggle to get access to the water they need. Fortunately, once a vineyard is established and mature, you know, year two and three, the best wines are actually not irrigated, which surprises most people. Across Europe, in quality wine production in Europe, you cannot water the grapes. In California, I would argue that the best producers, they abide by that as well um, by themselves. But obviously, to get the vineyard up and running, you do need to water it. And then the amount of water used in wine production, I worked to harvest a couple of years ago, it's it's mind bending for good reason. I mean, just every single person has a hose in their hand for probably 90% of the day, whether it's rinsing out buckets, spraying buckets, cleaning out tanks. You know, it's an agricultural industry. So water is always going to be an issue in any agricultural industry. And it's especially an issue uh, because of the drought. But the one issue that's always jumped out to me, it's probably the, the issue that's gave me the, let's say the confidence to start writing about wine. Because I'm in DC, because I'm a, a policy geek, the one issue that really got me excited about writing about wine was the three-tier system in the United States. What does a three-tier system mean? Well, after prohibition, when prohibition was repealed, states were given the right to control the distribution of alcohol within their own borders. That's why Pennsylvania is a control state. In Pennsylvania, you only actually buy liquor from the state. Lots of states have really backward rules but like that. What virtually every single state did after prohibition was they set up a tier in between the retailer, which of course was the person facing the consumer, whether that's a retail wine shop, a bar, a restaurant, and the producer of the liquor. They did that for a couple of reasons. One of the main reasons was uh, during prohibition, as most people now know, the control of alcohol was controlled entirely by organized crime. And prior to prohibition, there were a lot of 
strong arm tactics to get bars and restaurants to carry certain producers' goods. So a lot of really well-intentioned people thought to themselves, well, you know what? If we create a little bit of space between the retailer and the producer, it will be better for everyone. There's been a whole lot of issues there. And the biggest issue to me is an issue that affects a lot of family-owned wineries in California. In virtually every state, a producer is required by law to go through a distributor before selling their wine to a retailer or a restaurant. So what does that mean? Well, obviously, if you're a middleman, if you're a wholesaler, there's some huge ones in the country. Republic National is one of the big ones. Um, you know, there's uh, at this point, there's been a lot of consolidation over the last few years. Just two wholesale companies control over 50 percent of the U.S. distribution market. And everyone is forced by law to use those services. It is a state mandated middleman. So what that means is if you're a small winery in California, sure, you're allowed to sell your wine directly to consumers. But if you want to get into a retail shop in, say, New York City or a retail shop in Chicago or a restaurant in Louisville, you have to go through a wholesaler. Now, a wholesaler is not going to be that interested in somebody that only makes 300 cases of wine a year. It's much easier for them to push the products, whether it's high-end wine or affordable wine. It's much easier for them to push products that anyone can find on any supermarket shelf because there's a lot of brands out there. So it really does hurt small growers because say, Rowena, let's say you own a winery in Napa. Maybe that'll, you know, maybe one day that's going to be, that's going to be you up there making some, some great cab and some great Merlot. If you own a winery up in Napa and want to sell your wine to a friend who owns a restaurant in Dallas, you're prohibited, you know, by Texas law from doing so. You want to do that in Missouri, you're pre- in, in St. Louis, you're prohibited by law from doing so. So this, the fact that it's a state mandated, mandated middleman is, you know, one of those things that's really bothered me for a long time. And it's becoming, you know, it, it ebbs and flows, flows as a, as a fight. And it's becoming sort of a bigger fight again as the wholesale industry consolidates a lot. Well, Dave, what are the chances for reform there? We've got a a more free market administration in Washington. And as many of the states are more free market oriented these days, do you think you'll start to see some victories there? I'm not that optimistic. The wholesale lobby tends to be, it is mostly a state issue. So firstly, it's mostly a state issue. Secondly, they are one of the most politically active and politically generous lobbying groups out there. Never forget, you know, this, this became a big issue in Maryland a few years ago. And I had an op-ed in the Washington Post breaking down what this meant for consumers in Maryland and why they were really getting the short end of the stick. And the state legislator who sponsored the initiative that I wrote against wrote me an email. I also wrote a letter to the editor. And he said, you know, he was, he was horrified and offended by my column. And he wrote to me and he said, when I drafted this, I got all the stakeholders together to make sure it wasn't going to hurt any of them. And the stakeholders were the producers, the retailers, the wholesalers. And we figured this out. You know, we figured this law out together. And I wrote him back and I said, you know, you mentioned three of the four stakeholders. The fourth stakeholder is the consumer, is the wine drinker. And that should be the most important constituent. I mean, that's your constituent. Those are the people you're supposed to represent. You're not supposed to draft legislation in a back room with three guys smoking cigars who tell you they represent the stakeholder when the true stakeholder are all of your constituents who are paying higher prices as a result of the state mandated middle tier. So I I hate to say it. I'm just not optimistic. I think it's it takes a lot of organization. And, you know, unfortunately, um, I guess. Yes, maybe one day there will be a, a National Rifle Association or an AARP for wine drinkers. But thus far, there's been a lot of efforts to rally wine drinkers together. And, uh, you know, it's, it's probably like herding cats. It's a difficult thing to do. So now for the fun stuff. You have also edited a great book called The Everything Wine Book, which you say is a complete guide to the world of wine. So if you're giving advice to a wine novice, what kinds of things should they be looking for when trying to find a great bottle of wine? You know, it's, it's funny. That, that it is called A Complete Guide to the World of Wine because I've never been afraid of hyperbole. So it's good that e- even a book I edited five years ago, <laughs> I described that way. What, my one piece of advice for folks buying wine, and I say this a lot, is to embrace the obscure. And here's what I mean by that. Iconic wine regions and iconic wine grapes come with sort of a built-in surcharge. In other words, when folks go to a steakhouse, they might want a Napa cab. Real wine geeks, or maybe if you're having you know chicken or duck, or salmon, you want a Burgundy because that's the birthplace of Pinot Noir. When you want to celebrate something, you want Champagne. You know, there there's a really great reason why those are the regions or those are the grapes that come to mind for all of us. But there's no denying the fact that because it's a supply and demand issue, those regions of the world can certainly command a premium. They do come with a built-in surcharge. As you guys surely know, it's really difficult to find a decent bottle of wine from Napa. Geez, these days for probably less than 50 bucks, especially reds. Russian River Valley in 
Sonoma, home of some great Pinot Noir and some great Chardonnay. Really tough to find something for less than 30 bucks. Look at Champagne or Burgundy. It's tough, Champagne especially, it's tough to find anything for less than 50 bucks. Trophy wine regions are expensive. But what I would say is the, the world is awash and affordable, great tasting wine. There's more great wine being produced in more regions than ever before. And how do you find those wines? You do you find those wines in one of two ways. The first way is you find obscure grapes from maybe not even that obscure regions, obscure grapes from regions that people might have heard of. So what do I mean by that? Well, we think of Spain. We know Spain makes makes good wine, but folks aren't really drinking when they think of white wine. They think of Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc or maybe Riesling. They don't necessarily, Albarino is not the first grape to come to mind. So that's an example of sort of embracing the obscure. Same thing with red. We know Pinot Noir, we know Cabernet, we know Merlot. Grenache is a grape that doesn't come to mind often. Um, so I always tell people, hey, listen, if you're looking for some great value, say for a party, grab a Spanish white like Albarino and grab a Spanish red like Grenache. Those are really going to be generally going to punch way above their weight class when it comes to sort of value. But you got to keep in mind your audience. Let's say you're, you know, hosting donors for a dinner at a steakhouse. Well, they probably don't want Albarino and Grenache because they don't know how to pronounce the grapes maybe, or maybe they've never heard of the grapes and they want something that there, there's a lot to be said for comfort. So you want Chardonnay, you want Cabernet. For that, I would say go to a region that people, that's not top of mind. What do I mean by that? I mean, go to South Africa, go to Chile. Um, lots of great wine being produced across the world. So if you're looking for value, I would either go for the obscure grape from the not so obscure region or the not obscure grape from an obscure region. That's great advice. Your most recent book is called But First Champagne, which you say is a modern guide to the world's favorite wine. So tell us, why has champagne become the world's most popular wine? And what are your, some of your favorite champagnes or sparkling wines, depending on the region of the world? Sure. Well, I guess I'll start with uh, why I say that champagne is, is the world's favorite wine. So many reasons, so many reasons. You know, one of the reasons I wrote the book is because I got into champagne. And I got into champagne because it's that one wine that almost, that always makes people smile. When you hear that cork pop, and of course, if you're opening it correctly, you actually shouldn't hear too much of a pop. But when anyone hears the cork pop, no matter where you are in the room or at the party, you probably turn your head and you probably smile. You probably get excited about it. There's something sort of ceremonial about the clinking of glasses when champagne is in them. There's something ceremonial about popping open the cork to start a special dinner or to start an evening. No matter the theme of a dinner, um, and I say this, you know, wine geeks everywhere have tasting groups and have tasting dinners and get together, whether it's to taste a vertical of uh, somebody in Bordeaux or to taste the cross of vintage from Napa, whatever it may be. And what I realized a long time ago is no matter the theme of an evening, if you show up with a bottle of champagne, people are going to be appreciative and you're not going to get kicked out of the room. So it's, it's a great way to show up to an event when you don't have the wine you're supposed to show up with. Well, if you show up with a nice champagne, people will probably uh, still let you take part. So it became that because, you know, champagne, the region truly does offer a, a magical combination of soil and climate that's perfect for sparkling wine. So that's why most champagne, when people drink it, they do enjoy it. Of course, I could go on and on and on about how I think it's done a disservice to uh, champagne that some producers in America call their products champagne, even though they're not from the champagne region. That has to do with sort of a, a quirk of uh, U.S. trade history, but we don't need to go down that rabbit hole. Real champagne from champagne is generally speaking really delicious. Um, so it's sort of perfect for celebratory events, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you also can't ignore history and the impact of uh, the world's obsession with champagne on history. Um, one of the things that I talk a lot about in my book is that virtually every major conflict in the Western world was the battle lines were drawn in champagne. The Western Front, World War I, all the trenches, some of which you can still see, are in champagne. World War II, Nazi Germany, you know, occupied champagne. And the end of World War II was negotiated in champagne. So, you know, a lot of victories were celebrated with champagne in the region and near the region. A lot of losses were drowned in champagne in the region and outside the region. So for a really long time, champagne has just sort of been a part of Western European culture, for, for lack of a better phrase, and as this sort of uh, ceremonial beverage that always brought a lot of pleasure to a lot of people. The other thing, the other history that's tied closely to champagne is the history of advertising across the world. Um, one could make a very compelling argument that the modern day advertising industry, what we think of as marketing, all got its start thanks to champagne. I mean, it was really French luxury goods that started what we think of today as advertising with posters on lampposts in Paris, advertising luxury goods in France. And so many of those luxury goods were champagne. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's how I would say it became uh, the world's most favorite wine. 
Dave, there's a lot of debate these days over how wine is packaged, whether you go with a screw cap or a traditional cork or plastic, though plastic really is not in as much vogue these days. I know on my last trip to the Santa Inez Valley, I spent way too much time hearing about the virtues of cork versus plastic versus screw caps when I would much rather have been drinking at that particular winery. (laughs) So what are your thoughts on this very controversial debate in the wine world? <laughs> you know, I wish it I wish it weren't controversial. What I would say is I hate screw cap, but so many more wines should be under screw cap. And here's what I mean by that. Screw cap is wonderful for wines that you don't have any intention of aging. Not because wine under screw cap is not going to age, but wine under cork, uh, the way a wine develops, the high-end wine, uh, when cellared correctly, changes over time. We all know that. The best wines become more complex. They become more interesting. They gain gain layers of nuance and layers of flavor and layers of aroma. All these great things that we associate with aging wine and what a mature wine can be. What we know of is all because of how wine ages under cork. When wine ages under cork, it's not a reductive environment. In other words, when there's a screw cap on that bottle, that bottle is a time capsule. It is sealed. It ages in a reductive environment, an environment without any oxygen whatsoever. How much oxygen passes through a cork that's still up for debate, but we know that there's at least some. And the way wine ages under cork, you know, sort of historically, we have come to really appreciate how wine matures under cork. Well, the vast majority of wine is not aged. Uh, The vast majority of of wine drinkers really don't care about aging wine. So whether it's, you know, a summertime rosé, a simple white wine, a simple red wine just to enjoy with a Tuesday night dinner, I think all of those wines should be under screw cap. And a lot of the hesitation to it is not because people you know, care about how a wine is aging, uh, is going to age. A lot of sort of the controversy about it is because of this, again, to, you know, I use this word a lot when I talked about champagne, but it's about the ceremony. You know, when you go out to a, to a dinner and you order a bottle of wine off, off the restaurant wine list, whether that's a $25 bottle or a $250 bottle, when the waiter comes to your table and pulls that cork, you expect to see the, the cork. You, you know, you expect to see the cork screw. There's this whole ceremony with it. And it's just not as romantic when there's a screw, screw cap. And, you know, there's no denying the fact that there's uh, there's a lot of romanticism to wine appreciation. Dave, in another area of debate, we're all familiar with the old rules of serving white wines with light meals and red wines with meat and heavier meals. But lately, there's been a movement to throw out those all of those old rules and just drink the wines that you enjoy the most. So where do you stand on this? Old rules or new rules or somewhere in the middle? Somewhere in the middle, closer to the new rules. I say that because there are some food and wine pairings that do totally, totally, totally clash. Uh, asparagus doesn't work with any red wine, even though so often you see a nice piece of steak with a you know big chunk of asparagus and a red wine on someone's dinner table. Um, I can't tell you how sad I feel when I go to an Indian restaurant and see people ordering these huge red wines off the list. And all I think to myself is like, my God, how are you going to eat chicken tikka masala with that wine? It's going, you know, it's going to be, bl- you're not going to appreciate the wine at all. The flavor in that dish is going to totally bludgeon the wine, distract from the dish, distract from the wine. It's just not going to work. That said, in my sort of utopia, people have a bottle of wine open on the dinner table every night, just like you maybe have some salt and pepper on the dinner table every night. And to get there, everyone's got to relax about it. You know, drink what you like. What I would say, the body of a wine matters a lot. The sorts of wines that go with absolutely everything tend to be fresh, um, have a lot of acid. So what do I mean by that? Pinot Noir can really go with just about everything. Um, um, Beaujolais, not Beaujolais Nouveau, but real Beaujolais can really go with just about everything. Chablis can just about go go with just about everything. Uh, sparkling wine can go with just about everything. There are some really aromatic grapes, say Sauvignon Blanc, that do clash with a lot of stuff. And then on the red side, there's a lot of really tannic grapes, say Cabernet and Merlot, that really just don't work with dishes where you need that freshness in your mouth. So yeah, you know, there are some rules I try to stick by, but so long as people have a bottle of wine on the dinner table, I'm, I'm generally happy seeing it. Dave, we're so very fortunate to have you on as we approach the holiday season, and I know many folks are looking for wine ideas for entertaining. I know I am, as I have uh, 40-plus people coming over to the house soon for my Christmas extravaganza, and I'm, I'm always looking to impress my guests. So can you give our listeners and me a recommendation or two for maybe a trendy wine that we might consider serving our guests as we stock up for our holiday parties? 
Sure. Well, you know, you mentioned the word trendy. So if they're looking to impress their guests and their guests happen to be, say, a group of wine geeks, uh, the trendiest thing right now is called Pet Nat. Pet Nat is sort for naturally petulant and naturally petulant wines are actually sort of the original sparkling wine. Before folks figured out how to launch a secondary fermentation inside the bottle, which is what champagne is famous for, and that's now known as the champagne method or the traditional method of making sparkling wine, the precursor to that was naturally petulant wine. Quick side science lesson for everyone. I'm assuming everyone knows this. How do you create alcohol? Well, yeast eats sugar. Byproduct is alcohol and CO2. So if you bottle a wine that's still fermenting, fermentation has not totally, totally, totally finished yet, it's still going to be bubbly because that that yeast was still eating sugar in there. So if you capture that in the bottle, that primary fermentation is not finished yet, and you're going to capture the the unresolved CO2 in that bottle of wine. So these are really trendy right now, in large part because they're so easy to drink. Because fermentation hasn't finished, they're always going to be a little bit sweet. There's going to be a little sugar left in there, and they're fun. You know, the bubbles tend to be really different from the bubbles you might see in a champagne or a cava. Um, They're not as small. They sort of fill your mouth a little bit more. So, you know, if you're looking for something trendy, there's a lot of great pet gnats out there for, you know, 12, 13, 14 bucks a bottle because it's sort of a trendy thing that young winemakers are doing a lot of. They generally have fun labels as well. So that's one direction to go in. The other direction to go in, especially for folks in California, a lot of, you know, sort of the younger, hipper growers in California, because of land costs uh, in the sort of the iconic regions like Sonoma and Napa, you know, they're looking elsewhere like Lodi, where not only are they finding more affordable grapes, but they're also finding more obscure grapes because there's a lot of sort of old, you know, there's a lot of old vineyards in regions across California like Lodi, where you can find grapes that don't necessarily come top to mind for people. So a lot of really young uh, producers that people are getting really excited about are going a little bit off the beaten path. Uh, in California, finding grapes that are off the beaten path and making really delicious wines, in part because they're great winemakers, in part because the vineyards have so much age. So, you know, I think any any obscure grape from a member of the new California movement would be another way to impress your guests because they're going to be drinking uh, grapes that they've never heard of. And they'll say, wait a second, this is from Lodi or this is from, you know, the sandlands of the coast of California where Humboldt County is making some great wines these days. Obviously, when people think of Humboldt, they think of uh, a different agricultural product than than grapes. So, you know, it's fun to sort of uh, show show people what else California is capable of. So, Dave, many are also looking for great bottles of wine as gifts. Let's go through the full range here. What are some of your favorite wines that are under, say, $20, $25? And if you can tell us some of your favorite wines for higher budgets and people with more expensive tastes. I promise I'm not answering the question this way because my my most recent book is is about champagne. But I am going gonna, gonna to talk about sparkling wine. The reason I'm going to talk about sparkling wine is because with the holidays coming up, I think when you give somebody a bottle of sparkling wine, it sort of makes a celebratory statement. People are excited about it, whether they open it that night with you, within a few days with with their spouse, or six months later, they're probably going to remember, I got that bottle of sparkling wine from Rowena, from Tim, whoever it may be. They remember that more than they're probably going to remember a bottle of red wine because so many folks are giving red wines to make a statement as a gift. For under $25, the uh, the sparkling wine I recommend all the time because it's widely available and because it's really good is the Rotorer Anderson Valley Brut. Retails for about 25. I think you can find it at Costco probably for about 20 bucks. It's a delicious wine. Obviously, Rotorer traces its origins to the Louis Rotorer Champagne House. So, you know, they have a lot, they know what they're doing when it comes to, to making traditional method sparkling wine. And same made from the same grapes as Champagne, made from Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And it's just always, always uh, really over delivers Um, and people really love it. If you're trying, you know, if maybe you owe somebody a a really big thank you, or maybe you you had a a really great, great, great year, so are feeling flush with cash, one bottle I always recommend as well is Krug. A lot more expensive than Rotorer, whereas Rotorer can be found for $20 or $25. It's hard to find, you know, generally speaking, if you're buying a bottle of Krug, you're spending about $150 a bottle. And I I mention it because Krug is often sort of put up there with Dom Perignon. Great champagne, don't get me wrong. Dom Perignon does make about 5 million bottles of champagne a year. Krug makes about 400,000 bottles of champagne a year. So much, much, much smaller production. And it's a really unique champagne. When we think of champagne, uh, generally speaking, you're talking about a non-vintage champagne. Every house has a style. They try to recreate that style every year with reserves of wine that they've been aging forever so that every year they can sort of recreate that flavor. For most champagne houses, what does that mean? That means two to three years worth of reserve wine that they're putting with the most recent vintage to try and sort of have that house style year after year 
after year. Or they make a vintage wine, again, like Dom. You know, when they were in a good vintage, which for them is almost every year, they're releasing a vintage wine. Krug sort of uh, does a hybrid approach. Yes, it's a multi, it's a non-vintage wine, but it's a multi-vintage wine. So every bottle of Krug you drink is probably going to have wines from about 10 to 15 different vintages inside the bottle, ranging anywhere from 20 to 30 years worth. So you get some of the fresh notes that you might expect from a, you know, a, a just off the shelf champagne. You're also going to get a lot of the age notes that uh, folks who sell our champagne and really appreciate champagne. So it's one of those wines that just, it always sticks out, not like a sore thumb, but it, you know, it always sticks out as, as a u- interesting, unique experience. And I, I mean, I can't think of anyone who doesn't take a sip of Krug and say, wow, this is one of the greatest things I've ever tasted. It certainly would make a statement. And, and that's probably what I would recommend. Well, finally, Dave, you know, PRI is blessed to call home one of the world's best wine regions in California. You know, PRI's main offices in San Francisco are just a stone's throw away from the internationally renowned Napa wine country. But here where I am at PRI's Sacramento office, we're just a short drive away from great wine regions in Lodi and El Dorado and Amador. In Southern California, we're blessed to be near both the Santa Barbara and Temecula wine regions. So what are some of your favorite California wines that you're drinking and recommending these days? So, you know, earlier I mentioned the sort of younger, hipper growers going to obscure regions. You know, the folks that sort of inspired that movement, which is probably the bleeding edge of, of the new California wine, are in what, uh, you know, I don't think they they called it at the time, but what is now known as the new California movement. Um, hopefully some folks listening to the podcast have heard the name John Bonet. Uh, John Bonet was the San Francisco Chronicles wine columnist for many, many years. Uh, he left the Chronicle, geez, uh, probably uh, maybe a year and a half, two years ago now. He's now in New York writing for Punch Magazine. But he wrote a book a few years ago called The New California. And basically his thesis was, you know, from the mid 90s until about 2005, maybe even as late as 2010, California winemakers really started putting the throttle all the way up, turning the volume all the way up when it came to their wines. This is, you know, folks were drinking Australian Shiraz. Robert Parker had more influence uh, than any critic in any industry ever. And he was rewarding wines that were huge huge and ripe and boozy. Um, so a lot of winemakers started sort of pursuing that style. And the winemakers that were sort of, uh, you know, kind of pushing back against that style and saying, this is not classic California. These these wines don't taste anything like the classic wines of the world. These don't taste like the wines that we should all be trying to pay homage to with the great soils we have here. Eventually, they become known as a, as a movement called New California. And that was the name of John's book. Those are the producers in California that I absolutely adore. Um, um, so, you know, a couple names that come to mind, small family winery called Mathiasen there in Napa. There's a great, uh, one of my favorite Napa cab houses is called Larkmead. They're one of the most historic properties in all of California. They're uh, one of the only uh, uh, Napa Valley cabs I buy year in and year out. The winemaker there, a guy named Dan Petrosky, on the side, he has his own label called Masacan, where he's making Friulian style white wines. That's Northeast Italian style white wines in California. There's fewer wines I'd sort of rather drink on a hot dog. August day. So, you know, I could sort of name a lot of names, but I would say basically pick up John's book, The New California Wine, probably came out four years ago now. Pick out virtually any name in that book, whether it's Saratas, Arnett Roberts, uh, Liquid Farm, uh, lots of these new California producers who just make wines that are, you know, eminently drinkable. Thanks so much, Dave. You're welcome. Thanks again to our guests, David White and to Tim and Aya. To visit terroirist.com, go to T-E-R-R-O-I-R-I-S-T dot com. His books are also available at Amazon.com. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Also, check out our blog, Right by the Bay, at our website, pacificresearch.org. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. We hope you'll come back for another episode of PRI's podcast.